In the last part, we took the working CPU and gave it a memory upgrade by changing it to a 16-bit address bus from an 8-bit one. The final major component to add to the CPU is the stack, which will allow us to reuse subroutines in the code with the call and return instructions. In order to do that, we first have to make a few changes in the current design in preparation for it. So stay tuned as we alter the design to use a top-down startup, add a 2K ROM to the system, and using a 4-line to 16-line decoder, break up the address space into 4K blocks. Perfect for a little computer. So let's get to it. Have you ever wondered how you can make your own CPU or microcontroller? Have you ever been curious about field programmable gate arrays, also known as FPGAs, but find them to be mysterious black boxes? Or wish you had a microcontroller-like device with a larger memory address or wider data bus? Well, stay tuned as we delve into the world of FPGAs and create a CPU and eventual microcontroller from scratch. Hello, and welcome to 100 Random Tasks. I'm your host, Philip Lett, and if you like what you see here, please give us a like and leave a comment. And subscribe if you want to be notified when more videos are uploaded, and it would really help the channel. So what's the difference between a bottom-up CPU and a top-down CPU? At reset, a bottom-up CPU starts executing code at address 0, or the bottom of the memory map, and increments from there. A top-down CPU, by comparison, at reset, immediately executes a jump instruction by loading the jump to address from the top of the memory map. In this case, from addresses FFFE and FFFF. In those two locations is the address F800. So the CPU then jumps to address F800 and begins code execution from there. Of course, this can be any address as long as there is valid code to execute there. I picked F800 here since this is where the ROM will start when we put the next circuit together. Here we are with the design so far. To prepare to make this top down, there are a few things to update. First, if you remember from a previous video, I combined the ALU accumulator and flags register into a new block and connected them together using just a Verilog file instead of a schematic. I'm going to update the design to use the new block and save some space on the overall schematic. That video should be in the playlist sidebar if you want to check that out, and I'll leave a link in the description as well. Next, I'm going to remove the bus enable line. Since it's no longer needed, and replace it with a bus access output line. This will just be anding the read and write lines together, so that if either goes low, the bus access line will go low, indicating the CPU is accessing the bus. I'm also going to add an instruction marker output. This is so that I can detect when the instruction is on the data bus, which I'm going to use later in the stack to help demonstrate the program operation. This is easily accomplished by taking the 3-bit count output from the control block, and when they are equal to 1, which is fetch 2, which is also the instruction to be loaded, it sets the output high.
Since the CPU is the only device using the bus at this point, I'll also tie the address output buffer enable low for now. Next come the changes to the CPU to make it top down, meaning that when the CPU resets, the first instruction that will execute will be a jump instruction. And this address to jump to will be placed at the top of the memory, at FFFE and FFFF, as explained earlier. The changes needed will be to set the instruction register to 03 when reset, which is the code for the jump instruction. Next, the address register control block reset vector value needs to be changed to FFFE. In a future video, when I add an interrupt, the interrupt vector will be located at FFFC and FFFD. The last change is to set the count in the control block to 2 at reset, since that is the state number for jump 1. This is because we've already set the instruction register. With that done, there is still a small problem. The CPU is set up that the control block sets up the control lines on the falling edge of the clock, and all registers change on the rising edge. So what happens if the reset line is cleared while the clock is high? Well, on the next falling edge, the control lines will be altered, but the reset state at jump 1 will not have been completed first. So the program will not load the reset address correctly and fail. To prevent this, we need the rising edge of the reset pulse to be in sync with the falling edge of the clock to ensure that the control lines are set properly with the jump 1 values. We can do this by running a reset line through a D-latch with the clock input inverted. With those changes finished, the next step is to rebuild the external computer circuit and check that all these changes are working correctly. Lastly, I went ahead and updated the pin constraints file to place all the pins where I'd like them to be, as well as removed the unused pins and added the new ones. Here's the schematic of the newly designed system. On the left is the CPU, in order is the 2K EEPROM, 2K RAM, and the output port as before. There is also a 75, 154, 4-line to 16-line decoder. This will do most of the address decoding for us. Output 0, which is from address 0 to FFF, will be for RAM and is connected to the chip select of the RAM chip. Output 8, which is from address 8000 to 8FFF, will be for the output port. And output 15, which is from address F000 to FFFF, is for the ROM, and where the program will be stored. Since the ROM is only 2K and the decoder uses 4K blocks, we have to take care of A11, since the ROM has A0 through A10, and the decoder is A12 to A15. So if A11 is high and the decoder 15 is low, then the ROM chip select will be low. This will be done using two NAND gates as I've shown here. The output 15 is inverted with the first NAND, so when 15 is low and A11 is high, the output of the second NAND gate is low, enabling the ROM. The output port should only be active when the decoder 8 output is low, the write line is also low, and the clock goes from low to high. I've done this with two inverters and two AND gates. Additionally, I've added LEDs to indicate when the read or write lines are active, as well as when the RAM, ROM, and output ports are active. With that drawn up, let's build the circuit.
On the top breadboard is the ROM, with the ROM access LED next to it, followed by the read and write LEDs. Next is the reset button and the 4-line to 16-line decoder. In the bottom breadboard is the output latch, 8 output LEDs, and on the right is the port access LED. At this point, I haven't added the RAM. That will happen in the next video because it isn't necessary to test the top-down setup and will keep things a little neater for now. A quick side note, when working with logic gate chips, make sure to pull all unused inputs either high or low as I've done here. Don't leave any inputs floating. Doing so can introduce all sorts of noise or spurious signals into your circuit, causing it to not work as expected. I've been down that road before, so let me save you the trouble. This is a golden rule, just like placing decoupling capacitors on all power pins. If you remember from the previous program, it started at address 0, with the add A instruction at address 2. So when the program gets to the jump instruction, it jumps back to address 2. In the new top-down version, the program will start at address F800, which is the start address of the ROM in the system. Everything is the same as before, except for the address of the jump instruction, which is now at F802. With the altered program, we can now program the ROM and see if it works. Here I have the propeller programmer from a previous video, and if you want to check that video out, I'll leave a link in the description. At the bottom is where the program data is stored, which will be programmed starting at address 0 of the ROM. At the very bottom is a line with the heading boot. These are the two bytes which will be written to the top of the ROM, which will be at addresses FFFE and FFFF, as I've said before, which holds the address where the program starts. In this case, it's F800. I'll go ahead and program it now. You can see the program is starting at address 0, and the boot address is stored at 7FE and 7FF. Now we're ready to go. I've already created the programming file for the FPGA, and I'll program it in a second. The clock will be in an A-stable mode. So once the Spartan is programmed, the output port should start counting, just like in previous videos. Okay, perfect. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. You can see that the read and write LEDs are flashing, indicating that it is reading and writing to the bus. As well, the port access LED and ROM access LED are also flashing, indicating when they are being accessed. Now that the CPU is set up for top-down, the next video will add the stack along with two new instructions, call and return. Plus, we'll add the 2K RAM back into the system where the CPU will access the stack. I'm still working on making my Spartan board available in the future, but as of this video, the chip shortage is delaying things quite a bit. I'll make an announcement on my website once they are available, so sign up on 100randomtasks.com to be notified when that happens. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button to get notified when I upload new videos and it really helps the channel. If you're already a subscriber, thank you. Your support means a lot. And if you like what I do here, consider becoming a patron to help me make more great content for you to enjoy. Thanks for watching. See you next time.